You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Dr. Jim Fetzer and Dr. James Tracy. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Happy to be here, Dave. Now, coming up pretty soon, you know how time flies. Today is March 4th. In 15 days, we're going to be at American Free Press's national headquarters in Maryland for a conspiracy symposium. And, of course, this was advertised in the American Free Press newspaper and on the website. I'm looking at it right here. The first 200 people who respond will be attending the AFP and Foundation to Defend the First Amendment free speech lecture, book signing, and reception feature, of course, you two fellas. It's Saturday, March 19th from 10 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon, and the address is 16,000 Trade Zone Avenue in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Of course, this is all on the website, and there'll be links here. The cost is $49 prepaid or $69 at the door, plus you'll get your choice of two books from American Free Press's extensive stock. And there's going to be a lot of events happening on that day from 10 to 5. And we do have some seats available. Of course, it's limited by how many people could fit in there, according to the fire code. So... Go David, ahead. let me just comment that, you know, those books, uh, I mean, if they average, for example, 20 bucks a piece, you're getting two free books. That really is offsetting in relation to the $49 prepaid. So I think that's uh, actually a pretty good deal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Of course. And what's included in that is also a buffet lunch. So, and of course, book signings and getting to ask you folks questions. Of course, the powers that be don't like this type of event at all because you two especially have a lot of folks out there who are pulling for you, especially in light of what happened with the banning of the Sandy Hook book and what happened to you, Dr. Tracy, with obviously a tenured professor many years at Florida Atlantic University just getting fired. So there's a lot of folks out there who've got your back or on your side who are literally fans, and they're looking forward to meeting you, to hearing you, to shaking your hands, to having you sign their books. But, Jim, this could be actually any book from the American Free Press. No, I know, I know, yeah. Dave. I was just making the point that... Um, if they select actually, it right, the, the movie. Yeah, rock, actually, yeah. it all fits. I mean, you get a nice package deal, and if you were interested in picking up a couple of books anyway, I mean, I think it's a nice arrangement, and I'm glad you put it together. Thanks, Jim. It comes out to be free, basically, because $49, two books are 40 and, of course, you're not paying for shipping and handling because you're there, and then the lunch and everything. So, yeah, you're right. It turns out to be free for prepaid and just $20 more at the door. So what do we get into here, Jim, Dr. Fetcher? What would you like to tell folks right now who haven't yet gotten their tickets to come and see you folks? Why should they come and see you, and what's going to be happening there? Well, it's actually a rather extraordinary occasion. I mean, here you have the editor of the book that was banned on Amazon. They had 20 books on Sandy Hook, only one of which drew conclusions disagreeing with the government, which happens to have 13 contributors, including a half a dozen Ph.D., current or retired college professors. I mean, this is actually... Actually, an historic book originally went on sale on 22 October, and nearly 500 copies had been purchased when they banned it on 19 November with no explanation. They said to review their guidelines, but the book had already passed their guidelines when it was published. It's very clear to me that this was a political event where Jay Carney, who'd been the spokesman for Obama at the White House, moved to Amazon.com to become senior vice president. I'm sure he had a role. The book blows apart the entire Obama gun control agenda, where we established that the school had been closed by 2008, that there were no children there for Adam Lanza to have shot, and that it was a two-day FEMA drill. In fact, one of the most fascinating aspects, Dave, is that participants became confused so that a lot put up donation sites already on the 13th before the crime had committed, and Adam Lanza's date of death was initially recorded in the Social Security death index as having occurred on the 13th, making his feet and shooting 20 children and six adults the following day all the more remarkable. <laughs> and James Tracy was the first, really, to undertake a scholarly investigation, publishing an article about the press conference held by Wayne Carver that had so many anomalous events. It was in the vanguard of attempting to expose the fraud where he has then been repeatedly subjected to attacks by Lenny Posner, who claims to be the father of Noah, a most unusual little boy, because Noah not only is reported to have died at Sandy Hook on 14 December 2012, 
well, but again in Pakistan on 16 December 2014, and where a death certificate that Lenny provided to Kelly Watt during nearly 100 hours of conversation they had where Kelly repeatedly asserted her skepticism about Noah turns out to be a fabrication with an authentic bottom connected with a fraudulent top. It doesn't even have a file number. It has the wrong estimated time of death at 11 a.m. when the shooting was taking place between 9.30 and 9.35. It's an obvious fraud. And if Lenny actually had a son who had died there, he would not have had to fake it. I believe that Lenny is worried that that if the hoax becomes known, that he may have to return in excess of a million dollars that he received from sympathetic but gullible Americans and might even be prosecuted for fraud. So that when James Tracy simply made an inquiry to determine whether or not Lenny had a legitimate copyright claim regarding the photographs of Noah, he turned it into a vendetta against James, which was picked up by several newspapers in South Florida, and pressure was clearly brought upon Florida Atlantic to fire him. This is an extraordinary event. The fact that their consciousness of guilt, that this is a clear violation of his academic freedom and responsibilities as a scholar, in my opinion, is indicated by the fact that the official reasons were the failure to submit certain forms about his outside activities in time after 35 years in higher education. I've never heard of such a thing. What would be appropriate is call him in and give him a verbal reprimand, roughly strike him across the knuckles with a ruler. If it were egregious, put his letter in a file. But the idea of terminating the position of a tenured professor for failing to file forms is simply absurd. And it's a travesty that organizations such as the Chronicle of Higher Education and AAUP haven't made this a cause because it's an indication of something profoundly wrong in our society today that a distinguished professor with a great record, popular with his teachers, fulfilling all of his obligations and more, undertakes the extraordinary effort to expose fraud, to protect the public from being deceived by an elaborate deception that has scammed anywhere from 27 to $130 million from the public. When he is pilloried and the fraud is allowed to continue is just a disgrace and a shame and an indictment of the irresponsible responsibility and the lack of diligence of these organizations, which claim to be standing up for academic freedom and the principles of American universities. Dr. Tracy is not going to be allowed. There are orders from his counsel to discuss the particulars of this case, but we will be, of course, going into, you know, in a broad brush way, the matter, the sad matter that happened. James, did you want to add a little bit to what Jim just said? I think Jim's covered a good deal of it. I don't want to be one to toot my own horn or anything of the like, but I think that this is one of the more important cases involving academic freedom that this country has seen in quite some time. Even though my university has gone about this in a furtive manner, firing me for not filling out paperwork and submitting it in a timely fashion, when the real issue is the criticism of Sandy Hook and other false flag events that our country, our government, has perpetrated upon us, upon the people with our own tax dollars. The situation is analogous to Amazon's banning of Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, not saying that it involved free speech or a curtailment thereof, but some other technicality. They're operating behind the curtains, giving us these excuses so as not to actually create any attention or public concern, when in fact the real attack is on free speech itself. Unfortunately. Jim, you regularly go around the country giving speeches and discussions and lectures, and you just actually were out in the western part of the country, I believe, out in Washington or Oregon. Dr. Tracy, how about you? Have you gone around and discussed this, or will this be the first time? This will be the first time that I've actually discussed this in a conference setting or public talk setting or the equivalent. I have spoken to a variety of alternative media outlets, as you may know, over the past month or so, but I've not actually done a public address such as this. Mm -hmm. And how are you feeling about that? I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to seeing and speaking with supporters of both Jim and I and our area of research, which, you know, is something that other academicians, they eschew, they ignore, they overlook, they don't want to rock the boat. 
They have a good thing with their tenured position in the academy, and they don't really want to take on these difficult questions that no one else, unfortunately, are addressing. These are extremely pressing political, national, geopolitical questions that we are raising and research that we are undertaking. And again, unfortunately, given that we have thousands of professors in this country, many of whom are in the humanities and the social sciences and are well-equipped to be able to address these types of questions, they do not do so. And I think that's a real failure of the academy. It makes it even worse. It propounds the situation when we have journalists and journalistic outlets that also fail to address these questions. And I'm, of course, not talking about American free press or other good alternative outlets, but rather the establishment mainstream media. They espouse the First Amendment and the right of a free press, and yet they don't actually use that to hold those in power's feet to the fire. Yeah, it's pathetic. Jim, you are going to be giving a video presentation on Sandy Hook and the Boston bombing. Why don't you tell the listeners about that? Yeah, I'll give a bare bones about Sandy Hook and about the Boston bombing, two separate presentations, each running 20, 30 minutes apiece, and you can see the evidence for yourself. It's really all the more convincing. I have given so many radio interviews, but it's uh, overwhelmingly more convincing to actually see the evidence up close and personal of what was going on on both of these occasions. I wanted to ask you, before we close this out, Dr. Tracy, how long were you at Florida Atlantic University? Since 2002. So we're talking almost 15 years, 14 years. With a spotless, flawless record as well, as Jim mentioned earlier, in terms of my teaching, research, and service. And personality. You're such a pleasant fella, and it really is sad to see something like this happen to someone such as yourself. And of course, you have a young family as well, right? That's right. Yeah, I have four children, ranging in ages from 11 months to 10 years old. Wow. How are you doing? I mean, I know that sounds like a ridiculous question, but how are you doing mentally? Well, you know, you have to look forward in a situation like this. And that's what I'm doing. I'm active in terms of helping to oversee the Legal Defense Fund that Jim, myself, and a group of others have established in order to help gather funds for a investigation and legal defense. And so that's, to a large degree, what is occupying my time right now and generally conversing with and collaborating with the legal team, the attorney, and that's more or less it. So it's something that one could really, I suppose, get down in the dumps when they are in a situation like this. But you have to also consider it to be something of an opportunity, a challenge. And I don't think that we are presented with those sorts of things unless there's some understanding that we can deal with them. That's the sort of faith that I have. And I'm sure that seeing all these folks out there on the 19th at the symposium is sure to lift both of you guys' spirits, seeing people who really are rooting for you. And I know this, that they do, because I see the comments that are posted in regards to you guys. And like I said, there's a lot of people out there who are rooting for you, who have your back. Jim, any final remarks? Well, I'm very much looking forward to seeing James there. I think it'll be a terrific occasion. And, of course, we welcome the one and all who want to learn about these threats to academic freedom and to liberty in the United States, because this is emanating from your own government. Federal, state, local authorities were all involved in both of these events. And it's completely shocking how the abject failure of the media to expose them, which has fallen to us, we welcome one and all. Hope to see you there. James? Yeah, I would just second that. I'm looking forward to seeing Jim and to addressing the audience and taking questions and having a good, a fruitful discussion. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for the time you spent explaining all this to the listeners and looking forward to seeing both of you on Saturday, March 19th at 10 in the morning. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much, Dave.